read this, email me immediately for your $50 gift card. <laughs> now, I didn't do it on yours, just so you'll know, okay? <laughs> if I had my time back and I'd known the Lord was going to allow me to send it out, I would have done that just to see who would have emailed me first. And I said, Brother Chris Fees is going to give you a gift card <laughs> for $50. But thank you, but thank you for being with us tonight. We are, uh, if you follow along in your Bible, we're in, in Psalms 138 tonight. Psalms 138. Um, those, you, those of you who have been a part of this study, have you enjoyed this study okay, though? Amen. I'll tell you, it's very, very relevant, I think, in the day that we're living in. And uh, just so thankful for what the Lord is doing and how he's speaking into our lives. Um, but it, obviously, it's no big secret if you got the outline when you came in or if you got the one that was emailed. The, the, the theme that's just been going through this study has been those uh, disruptive moments, disruptive moments. And, and we define those as those, those things that come up in our life that we're not expecting, we're not looking for, we don't want them. If we had to choose, we would choose to avoid them instead of have them. But nonetheless, they come up in our life. And um, it, it can be a variety of things. We, we've seen in this study from Dr. Jeffrey Jeremiah, he gave his own personal story, his bout with cancer. And he's talked about some of his friends and what they've had to deal with. And, and for us today, it could, be, it could be the death of a loved one. I mean, those things disrupt our lives. It, it could be a, a terminal sickness that we get. It could be a crisis that someone is going through that, that we know about. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? This is going beyond the ordinary. And I'm not making a lot of anything that we go through. This is not the pastor having a flat tire after church on one Sunday. This is not a head cold or sinus infection. This is something that comes and turns our world upside down. This is something that just completely shatters our life. It leaves us broken. It leaves us hurt. And there again, our situations are real. I'm not making a lot of, of the issues we face. But the, but the point of this book is to show you how certain things can really just disrupt life. And we leave not knowing how will we continue to go on. Chapter 5 is introduced with a, another story. One of Dr. David Jeremiah's friends, you, if you've read it, um, she and her family were doing well. They have a son that just graduated. His name was Kent. Kent's 18 years old. And his dad gets him an airplane, I guess, for maybe a, a graduation gift or so, I'm assuming. It's just a nice gift, I'm sure. And, and Kent's learned to fly the airplane. And you know what his goal is? He actually wants to be a missionary pilot. Isn't that a great goal, a, a wonderful future? I mean, he's got a bright future. Young man, he's a Christian. He's working part-time. So one Thursday, he tells his mom, it's getting late, but I'm going to go out for a few more test runs, a few lands, and uh, I'll be home by 9. Just save my dinner for me. Just leave the plate out. And unfortunately, Kent never came home. He and his friend were killed in that plane crash. And so there Carol is now trying to figure out, how do I go on with life? This has disrupted my life. This has turned my life upside down. And you, you have to ask, how is she going to get through this? How, how, I mean, I, I've lost grandparents. I've never lost a child. I've, left, I've never lost a parent. I, don't, I can't even fathom what she's facing. But she said this. She said that the, the, the time that followed them, the few months that followed, she grew closer to God during that time than she had ever grown in all of her years as a Christian. Now, that seems to me a, a strong statement. All of those years of serving God, all of those years of living for the Lord, but yet it took a few months after this death for her to really grow into that intimate relationship with God. And here we are tonight trying to figure out how does she do that? How can we do that? She mentioned a few things in her story. She said that um, she and her husband found strength when they would encourage one another. In other words, they, they never let one another start feeling too sorry for themselves. They were there to pick. You know, that's a good thing on the sidebar for us to remember if we're married tonight. It's always good for someone to be the encouraging person. When you're down, pick me up. And when you're down, I'm going to pick you up. You don't have to be married to be able to do that. We can do that as a church family, can't we? 
And I think that's the beauty of church. When you come into a place like this, if the Bible says the strong should bear the infirmity of the weak. And we should be here to encourage one another. I, I'll say this anytime I go to a place. Everyone needs a church family. Would someone say amen? amen. Online, you can say amen as well. We, you know, you need us and we need you as well. You need a church family. They found strength when they did that. She found strength in God's word. And maybe you say, well, Pastor, you can say that because you're the preacher. No, if I was not a preacher, I'd still say there's strength in God's word. There, there's just promises of God that we can hold on to, promises of God that we can cling to, and we need those things in our life. They found so much strength that they were able to minister to other people. Can you believe that? God allows us to go through things sometimes. He brings us to the point that we can help other people who minister. I shared with you recently in a message, and I think I even concluded in our second service Sunday with this, this quote. Uh, a gentleman I knew who, who did lose a son, he was one of our former football players, the, the young boy was, and he said this, i never forget it. He said, Mark, he said, what, what helped me was this, was keeping my friends close, keeping my family closer, and keeping God closest. I'll say that again if you didn't hear me say it in the message recently. Keep your friends close. Keep your family closer. Keep God closest of all. If, if we can learn to do that, God can get us in a position so we can begin to minister for him. That's what happened with this dear sister here. It wasn't easy, but she did it. I think that uh, David may have been in a similar situation when he wrote Psalms 138. If you have your Bibles, let's look there together tonight. <clears throat> now I get that water, please. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Thank you. Psalms 138. Psalms 138. The Bible says, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple. And praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. In the day when I cried, thou answered me and strengthenest me with thy strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord for great is the glory of, the God, of God. Listen at verse 6. Through, though the Lord be high, yet he hath respect unto the lowly. But the proud he knoweth afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou hast stretched forth thy hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thy own hands. We, uh, we, we look at Psalms 138, and I think maybe the next five or six that follow, and, and they are attributed to David. Honestly, we don't know the occasion. Why did David write this? What was going on in his life? Is there a certain occasion? We can't be dogmatic about that. But, but what we do know when we look at this verse, this passage rather, in verse 7, it was a time of trouble for David. Now, we don't know if he was in a, a present sense of trouble or if he was just reflecting back on a troubling time, but David understood trouble. Um, we, we've used this word before in, in a sermon, the word trouble. It, it means a, a narrow place, a, a place that's really confining. The, the image that you should see with this word is being backed into a corner and you don't have anywhere else to go. I don't know if you've ever felt that way in life, that, you know, whatever's going on with me, I, I am backed up. I have nowhere else to go. I don't see a way out. It feels like the walls are caving in on me. That's where David was at with this. We, we don't understand it all. David had faced all sorts of things in his life. But this was a troubling time. Some say, well, maybe it was when he was dealing with the battle with Goliath. Maybe, we don't know. Maybe it was him when he was running from Saul and hiding in a cave. We, we don't know for sure. Maybe it's when he had united the kingdom and he was having to fight the enemies. We, we don't know. Maybe it was when he was having the issues in the domestic problems of his home. We really don't know. All we know is he, he described it as being trouble. He described it as being to the point where I'm, I'm just being confined. I'm being closed in. 
Uh, I, my world is changing. I don't know what to do. And when we experience things like that, you know, it causes us to hurt. When we feel things like that, it causes us to feel broken. And David understood it. Now, I want you to get something here. You know, for, for David, we know David was a great worshiper of God. I mean, this was a man after God's own heart. This was a man that, that wrote many of the Psalms. But yet, he found himself in trouble. David was a mighty warrior for God. He killed the giant. He defeated many of the enemies of Israel. But yet in this lesson, he identifies himself as someone in trouble. David was a man who really knew how to work for God. He laid the plans and got the materials ready for the building of the temple so his son wouldn't have a, a hard time with it. But yet this man still had trouble right here. And I was going to say this, guys. If a man like David could experience trouble, there's a good chance that people like you and people like me could experience trouble as well. I, I said this Sunday, and, I, and I'm going to say it again, as a pastor, I really wish I could sit up here every Sunday and tell you, you will never have any problems in life. I wish I could always be so smiley and, and so happy and say you will always be exempt from trouble. Because you're a Christian now, here's a card that says trouble free. Just shine it wherever you want to go in life and never want to leave you alone. I can't do that. Not in good conscience. But what I've got to tell you is this. You will be tried and you'll be tested. If you really belong to God, things are not going to always go well in life. You know, sometimes there's going to be an issue on your job. Sometimes there's going to be an issue in your home. Sometimes there's going to be an issue with your spouse, with your children, or with your parents. And I can go on and on and on. It doesn't mean that they're bad people. It means that we live in a world that's just been cursed with sin. And every now and then sin would rise its head and things are going to happen. And we also live in a world where things just naturally happen. I mean, that people will get sick. And sometimes sickness becomes terminal. And sometimes it's going to lead to death. And God may choose to take someone out of this world. I'm just simply saying it's going to come up sometime. We're going to face trouble. David did. So what do you do in times of trouble? What do you do in times of trouble? And that's what the, the title of this chapter is tonight. When trouble comes. And here is Dr. David Jeremiah's suggestion. We worship. We worship. During times of trouble, we still worship. And when I look at this passage of Scripture, that's what David was doing. You know, uh, recently my, my wife taught a lesson here from Psalms 121. And, and she left us with a definition of worship I, I hope we never forget. She says it's from an old, I think an old English word, maybe maybe it's Latin. But it comes from the word worth-ship. Worth-ship. And it means that you attribute worth to whoever you're worshiping. So what that means to you and me is this. God is worthy of worship. Regardless of the trouble that we're facing, he's still worthy of praise. Regardless of the corner we're backed into, he's still worthy of honor. Regardless of how walls may be closing in on us, he's still worthy of any kind of respect and adoration we can give to him. He's where if anybody should be worshipped, if any should, anyone should be bowed down to, if anyone should be respected, it should be God himself. And David understood that in the midst of trouble, what you'll find out is David was still worshipping. And I may be getting off the script if it's okay, it's fine, you shouldn't have got it anyway. But let me just share this with you. When, when true worship happens, and, and you can just get beyond yourself and realize I'm focusing on God, let me tell you what you'll find out. You'll find out soon that you have an almighty God, an all-knowing God, and an ever-present God. But, but, but beyond all of the greatness and beyond all of the majesty, when you really get in an intimate way with Him, when there's, a, there's a place you can get with God. In the Old Testament, they said it was the Holy of Holies. When you just went beyond the veil and it was just you and God in the very presence of Him, I, I'm telling you, you'll find out He's not just a powerful God, but He's a very personal God. And you'll find out that He loves you with an everlasting love. 
love. And whatever is going on in your life, he's like your heavenly father. He invites you, if you will, in, in a metaphorically way to come and sit in my lap and let me wrap my arms around you. I don't care how old you are or how young you are or what kind of trouble you're facing. Just sit right here on daddy's lap. You can call me Abba Father and I want you to know how much I love you. We can get there with him. But the way we get to get there is through our worship. The Bible tells us that we enter his courts and his gates with thanksgiving and praise. We enter his presence with thanksgiving. Do you, do you get that? If we really want to get into the presence of God, and, and I'm talking to a group of people who understand that. I'm not talking about just going through the motions of church. I'm not talking about just going through the motions of a daily devotion. I'm talking about being in fellowship with the God that you knew saved you. I'm saying, listen, if you've never been there, God wants to know us in an intimate way. Amen. He wants to know us in a very personal way because you can get to that point with God and he can share things with you that mama and daddy could never tell you. You can get to such a place with God and he gives you a peace and it just baffles you to the point it passes any kind of understanding that you've got. Regardless of your degrees or your knowledge or, or, or what you've accumulated in life, God can speak into your heart and it settles you regardless of what's going on. And people on the outside are looking and they're saying, how can she do it? How can he do it? How did it keep going on after a while they have to testify? It's not them, but it's the God who lives within them and it brings God glory. Am I making any kind of sense tonight? Amen. 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 Go ahead and give him praise if you like to. So... We get to that intimate point with God, but we get there through our worship. And David understood that. And that's what he was doing in this, in this passage of Scripture. I mean, he says there here about three or four times, I will praise thee. I will sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple, and I will praise your name. David had resolved, in the midst of this trouble, I'm going to praise God. On the sidebar, and this is probably in the notes somewhere, the word mist of trouble is very important because trouble didn't just come and go. He was in the midst of trouble. You know, we can get up, and my first appointment may not go very well, but my second and third appointment through the day can get a little bit better. David had a bad appointment all day long. Have you ever been there? Here's, here's a good translation for in the mist. You're stuck. You're stuck in trouble. It's not moving. Can I be very personal with some of you tonight? For my, my school teachers in here, little Johnny's not going to leave your class this year. You're, I'm so, you're stuck with Johnny. The rest, of, I, I'm talking to somebody I know. All my CPA, yeah, you're stuck with that client and them losing receipts that you need to get in on time. And I could go on and on with, with our nurses in here and our doctors and so forth. Let, let me just tell you something. Our insurance agents, I, I, you, you get stuck with some of them good ones too. Yeah. It's your fault they got a ticket. I know. It's your fault their insurance is going up. It, it's your fault their house called up. I mean, I, I get all that. Sometimes we just get stuck and it's not going anywhere. What do we do? We learn to worship through it. We learned, I'm trying to make it as soft as I can, but we've got to get that. We've got to worship through these situations if we're going to ever get into the presence of God. We get into his presence with thanksgiving and praise. We've got to get, we've got to learn, regardless of how I feel, I've got to get to the point where when I come to the house of God, when I enter those doors, I'm going to enter thanking my God. I'm going to enter praising my God. Why? Because I need his presence in my life. Because here's what I know. When God shows up, when God is present, God can work. When God is here, now he's, he can work whether he's here or not, but you understand, but we can get to the point where, you know, you don't need no one to come up here and lay their hands on you because God can work in the front as well as in the back. Amen. God can work in this, in this altar. He can work in a sound booth. He can work in a classroom, but we've got to get into his presence and we get there through praise and thanksgiving. We get there through worship. David was there and you're thinking, how could this man worship God? With all the trouble, and I've got to move, with all the trouble that he's got going on in his life. He, he tells us here, look, these are the reasons he had given. He says, you know, I, I can worship here 
He says, because of your loving kindness and for your truth. David looked back, and loving kindness is just another word for mercy. I think it was Brother Joe Dan Lee that defined this when I first came to the church. That grace is getting what you don't deserve, and mercy is not getting what you do deserve. So in other words, David said, there was times in my life when I should have received X, but mercy said no. Has, has anyone ever heard mercy say no to you before? I mean, we haven't always been perfect people. And we deserve certain things in our life. But God in his loving kindness, God in his mercy says no. The point is David looked back at his life and he saw times that God was so merciful and so gracious to him. And he could thank God for that. I, I thank God because of mercy. I thank God, he said, because of truth. He went on to say, this is a pretty profound statement. He said, you have, you've magnified your word above thy name. And, and that's a powerful statement because the name of God is a, is a powerful name. And what he's doing in this text, he says, you know, I, I value, God is saying, I value my word so much. I am a man, I'm a God of my of integrity so much. I'm going to put whatever I say right there on the same bar as my name. So if I said it, you can count on it. Just as sure as I'm your God, if I said it, you can count on it. Just as sure as I'm your heavenly father, if I made a promise, you can. Am I making any sense? That's how good God is. And David looked back at his life. And he said, I see your loving kindness. I see your truth. And it's, he went on to say this. Not only that, you've answered me when I pray. And the, and the text there means your, your answer came immediately. And when it came, it brought me strength. Not physical strength necessarily, but strength for my soul. Do you realize, as I said Sunday, sometimes the emotional part of us is in just as much need as our physical. And David was there. And he knew when God came and he answered that prayer, that he brought strength to him that he didn't realize he had. Someone needs to hear that tonight because I know in your situations you probably are broken and you're probably hurt, but there's a God in heaven who loves you and he's able to strengthen your soul and give you strength for the journey that you need. David was there. He was there. We don't know what was going on in his life, but when he could reflect on what God had done, he knew. God could still answer prayers. So he was able to worship with an assurance. And that's what I've got to get to tonight. I've said a lot to get to this point. Okay? How do we worship with that kind of assurance? What do we need to do? There, there's five things here I've got on this outline for you, okay? Um, you may have the words already. If not, we'll give them to you slowly. I want you to get this. And again, this is a little deviation from Dr. David Jeremiah's book. If you go back and read this chapter, you'll probably say, well, I can see where Pastor Mark come up with that, okay? I just decided to use my own outline to nod. So the question is, how do we approach God? In times of trouble, this is very important for us, okay? In times of trouble, in times when we're back in that corner, in times when we've got those disrupted moments, how do we still press through and praise and worship God? Here's the first one. Our praise for God should be personal. Start there. It needs to be personal. And what I mean by that is this. If you look throughout this chapter, verses 1 through 6, you will see a lot of personal pronouns. Now, I wasn't an English teacher. I taught science, but I think that's the correct term, okay? They're very personal. He says things like, ah. He says things like, my. And then he goes on and says, thee, and, and thy, and thou. And finally, at the end, the Lord, the Lord. You know what David's doing here? He realizes I've got a personal relationship with God. I really know God. And when it comes to worship, I don't need to wait for somebody to worship for me. When it comes to worship, I don't need someone to beg me to worship. When it comes to worship, I know the God that we're worshiping. So I'm going to make it very personal. I'm going to worship my God. That's how it was for David. He knew God. He knew what God had done for him, and he knew what God was going to do, so he had no problem worshiping God. Here's the question for us. If we want to worship in times of trouble, I think for every Christian we're to ask ourselves, do we really know God? Is that a fair question? I mean, if, if we're Christians, do we really know him? Notice I didn't say, do you know about him? I can teach you a lot of things that I've learned about God. But do you know him? 
Mamas and daddies, I hope, are teaching things about God to their children. But one day, does the child really know God? If I were to ask it and not, and I don't think we have time to, to give responses, but what would your answer be if I said, who is God to you? When you, someone says God, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Oh, I like that. Father, say, we got time. Go ahead and shout them out to me. Go ahead. Father, Savior, what else says he to you? Lord, great. Anything else? Healer, good. Almighty. He's a creator. He's a Savior. He's the maker of this universe. But, you know, we need to know that. Well, it's got to get beyond the head, and it's got to drop into the heart for us. Now, remember, I'm asking you, how do we approach God in times of trouble if we want to worship Him? It starts by having a personal relationship with God. Now, I'm going to step out on a limb here. And if I'm wrong, I want you to correct me in love. I've, I've coached, and I've watched a lot of sports, and I've seen athletes come off the field, beaten, bruised, bloody, and say, first of all, I just want to thank God. And I admire that, but here's my point. I believe anyone can praise God. Yeah. I, I hope I'm not wrong there. I believe anyone in here can say, I praise God. But it takes a Christian to worship God. Because it takes spirit connecting with spirit. And if you haven't been born again, the spirit that was born within you is not a living spirit. It's still a dead, the Bible says, in trespasses and sins. But when you know God is your personal Savior, praise takes a whole new level. You get to, yeah, I, I love a good song that makes me clap my hands. But there's a place with God I want to get to where it doesn't matter if, you're, if you've got your hands raised or not because it's not about you at that point. It's not about if you're clapping, if, if you're singing even. It's about what God is speaking to me. We've got to get to that place. And you have to know him personally to be able to get there. So the first point I would say is, if we want to get to a place of his presence, we've got to start with personal praise. All right, the second one is this. Our praise should be plentiful. I hope that's a word. If it's not, let it be one to not, okay? Plentiful, plentiful. Listen to this. David said in, in verse 3, I will praise thee with my whole heart. He was just showing how sincere he was in it. Everything that's within me, I will give God praise. Then we used to sing a song like that, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. That's what David was saying here. You know why I believe because he looked back on his life. Maybe he looked back at the victory he over, had over Goliath, the, the, how he came through the situation with Saul. How he, uh, how he defeated the enemies of Israel. How he overcame and the Lord restored him back to faith when he messed up with Bathsheba. How he worked things out with his family. And he realized, God has done so much for me. And because God has done so much for me, I need to give him so much praise. Because he's done so much, he deserves it. Does that make any kind of... You see the relationship there. Now, I'll be the first to say this. If God hadn't done anything for you, don't praise him. I'm your pastor. If he has not done any I'll, online family, if God has not blessed you, don't praise him. Just stop. Don't go through the motions. But if he has, praise him. And based on this, the more he's done, the more he deserves. Am I making any sense? Yeah. He is, I don't know, what is salvation worth to you? Is that worth one hand raised or two? I mean, I guess it depends on the person. Sometimes it's worth standing on your feet. Sometimes it's worth lifting your voices. I'm just saying our praise should be plentiful. God has done lots of things for us. And when we bow on our knees to talk to him, before we ever ask him for a thing, we come to him because we know him. And let's begin to thank him for what he has done already. All the things that you mentioned earlier, if he is your creator, thank him for that. If he's your Savior, thank him. If he's your Lord, thank him. If he's been a provider, thank him. If he's been a protector, thank him. If he's made a way when you didn't sit, just whatever he's done for you, just stop and give him praise. Make your praise plentiful if you want to get into his very presence. Number three, got to, got to move on with it. Our praise should be public. Praise should be public. Should be public. Notice what he says here in verse 1 and verse 4 as well. He says in verse 1, 
He says, I I'm going to praise you. He said, before the gods will I praise thee. What he's referring to is obviously the pagan deities of that day. The, the enemies around him, all their gods. David said, I've got the courage to praise you in front of them. He goes on into verse 4. He says, and all the kings of the earth shall praise it. You know, regardless of who they are, the positions they hold, or the platforms they're on, I'm going to give God praise. This man said, I am not ashamed to praise God. I've got a boldness to praise God. He doesn't bother me to praise God. Why? Because he knew what God had done for him. He knew how God had blessed him. He knew how God had brought him through all these different things. And so now, because his God was so great, he didn't mind giving God praise. Now, here's a question. I think it's a fair question for us all. Are we ashamed to worship and praise God? It's just it's a good question, isn't it? Are we ashamed? Now, now, now hear me well. We are human, and we all have different natures, all right? And, and, and you know, because we're natured differently, I do respect that our, you know, maybe our praise is manifested differently, and our worship is. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? No, but here's what I want you to get to. Here's what I want you to get to. Don't do anything to try to draw attention to yourself. Something will be wrong with that type of worship and that type of praise. But if you're afraid to worship because of what he or she may say, your worship is directed in the wrong direction. Does that make sense? And, and it's okay. Now listen, uh, we're, I, I can remember this. And my wife will tell you, I used to play a lot of softball when I was a little younger. And I, and I was in the outfield. And, 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 and every now and then I would make a pretty decent catch. And I remember making one one time. It was, it was pretty, pretty you know, nice, you know, not to be boastful, but it was a pretty good catch. And, and it ended to end. And when I got up, I mean, I wasn't doing jumping jacks or anything like that. I just kind of did a fist bump, walked back to the bench. I, I was happy, you know. But, but I, I've been at games coaching. And, and, and every now and then I, I get a little bit more excited, you know. And I, I've, I've tried to get into players' face a few times and say things. And, and I've even watched games at home by myself. And, and every now and then I'll clap my hands when the game's going on. And I, will, and I don't say amen when I have, but I do clap my hands. Yeah. And I'll tell you what I'll do. Sometimes I'll get out of my seat and I'll go to another seat. Yeah. It, it, we, now, you know, we, we can laugh. We can laugh. But I bet if I was to ask some of you ladies, how, how do you act in your kitchen? Maybe when you're cooking one of those multi-layer chocolate cakes that the pastor's going to get one day from a certain member in this church. And you taste the chocolate, and it's good. I bet you, mm, I bet you just shake your head and smile a little bit. Or, or if something goes wrong with your stove and your gas runs out, I bet, I bet you make all kind of faces too. We're nature differently, okay? And so we're going to respond differently. But here's the point of it. If I can get up out of my seat for a football or a basketball game that I don't even have a ticket for, and it's not going to matter in eternity who wins or loses, really. But it just absorbs me to the point that I get up and, mm. or if it's good, I might go to my wife and give her a high five. Surely, when I come to the house of God, and we're talking about how good God is and how great God is, you know, you don't have to jump up and turn flips in church, but every now and then you can say, yeah, that is true. God is good. And you might say, yeah, he's right about that one. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just saying we can let our worship be public without drawing attention to ourselves. okay? If anybody deserves worship and praise, it, it's God, okay? Are we okay there? You still love me. I didn't offend anybody, right? Okay, good, good. And some fans have more to clap about than others. I get that, yeah. Carolina's not clapping hard right now. I, 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 we're, we're crying right now. We're going to get better. Let me go to this last one here, guys, okay? Uh, number five. Our, our praise should be perspective. Now, not perspective, pro, pro, P R O, perspective, prospective. And here's what I mean by that David said, Thou will, thou will revive me. What he was doing there was looking toward the future. That's what prospective is a, a, a prospective buyer, a prospective church member. Not our view on something, but how we're seeing the, the future. And that's what David did. He, he looked in, in the midst of his trouble. 
And, and, and God, he was just, he knew what God had already done for him. And he was stuck in the middle of this trouble. And, and I don't know at this point, maybe, who knows, if he was reflecting back, I've got to face this giant. What will God do now? Or, you know, I, I've got to deal with Saul. I'm hiding in this cave. What will God do now? The, the men who came to me in this cave are talking about stoning me. What do I need to do now? I have sinned. I have shamed God. I have embarrassed God. I, I am pure. I'm separated from God. What will happen to me now? When he can reflect on all the things that he had came through and what God had done, he said this, I have believed by faith that God will revive me, regardless of the trouble I'm in now, because I've seen what God has able to do, I believe he can just do it again, and, and I'm going to trust him, and he went on to say things like this, he said, not only will God re re revive me, but God will continue to protect me in front of all of my enemies, God is going to see me through, he went on to use the word here, I, I love this in verse 8, he says, he will perfect that which concerneth me, you know, that's the same same thing that we get in the book of Philippians. Do you remember that, that writing Paul had when he said, He that began a good work in you will perform it to the same day of Jesus Christ? That's the same verses right here. It's the same words. He says, God will uh, continue what he starts. He will complete what he starts. And that's the good news. God will see us through. God will bring us to the point he wants us to be. He had that by faith and got into the presence of God. Here's the question we have to ask ourselves. How do we praise or worship God with that kind of anticipation? Because this is a hard question, guys. Think about it. You know, you, you, you're praising God for who he is. I thank you for saving me. And you've done all the praising and all the worshiping, but at the end of the day, you're still stuck in that corner. You, you've praised, you've worshiped, you, you've taken notes on the sermons, and, and you say, Pastor, this will help me. But when you go home, the sickness is still there. It didn't go away. You go home, and unfortunately, he or she is still not there. The crosses didn't go away. The crosses didn't disappear. And so, Pastor, you're telling me I've got to worship with a perspective of the future? How do we do that? How do we worship with that kind of anticipation? I've got two suggestions real quick for you. One is this, you've, you've got to remember the past victories. That, that's a must. You, you, in your mind, listen to me, folks. The enemy, when we're in trouble, will always bring the negative. He will always bring negative thoughts. Sometimes he may even allow negative people to come in our life. I believe that. We've got to think about the positives. We've got to think, about, Lord, but this is what you have done. If he hadn't done it for you, just look around. You did this for her. You did this for him. This is how you helped the pastor and Sister Lynn. This is how you helped the church. Just think about any kind of victories you can. Think about the past victories. Second one is this. It's a must. You've got to remember the promises of God. I'm telling you this to help you. You, you've got to find, if it takes fasting and praying, seek God and seek a promise for your situation. Ask the Spirit of God, would you please speak to me in a way that I'll never forget? Can you make me a promise that I can hold to, that I can cling to? Because I'm telling you, when God gives you that promise, it's not like Pastor Mark reading, hey, why don't you try this verse? No, God gave it to you. He spoke it into your heart. Get it somewhere and write it down. Put it in your pocketbook. Put it in your billfold. Just bring it out whenever you need to. Say, but God, this is what you said. On the day that the corner feels like it's about to cave in, God, this is what you said. I don't know what your promise is. Maybe it's just, you know, Lord, you said. With your stripes, I'm healed. Lord, you said you've never seen your righteous forsaken or your seed begging for bread. Lord, you said you would meet my needs according to your riches, which are in glory. God, you said what you've put together, not let man put us under. There's a promise in the word of God for you. And I'm telling you, whether it's at work or whether it's at home or whether it's in the hospital, you can always hold on to that word and it'll take you through. And you can worship God with anticipation because you'll come to the point. I know this is what he said. 
saying. It's just like my daddy or my mom or my best friend. They're with me right now. He's walking with me and he's whispering that promise to me and he's going to see me through whatever I'm facing, whatever I'm going through. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. He's right there with me. That's what he does for you. That's what we do. That's what we really do. So you got to be able to worship that way to get to his presence. Jonathan, you can come to the pen if you like. We're going to we're going to close out here. Now, I, I, I read an interesting story Dr. David Jeremiah had. It's kind of humorous. He said, when we get ready to enter the gates, he said, we can come with a truck. But the question we have to ask ourselves is, what are we bringing on our truck? Because if we're not careful, when we get into the gates, it's a dump truck. Yeah. We unload complaint, we unload criticism, we unload pity. Now the Bible says we can cast our cares upon the Lord, and we should. But the best place may not be when you get ready to enter His gates. Because He says when you're going to enter those gates, you enter them with thanksgiving and enter them with praise. Bring a truckload of that on Sunday and see what the Lord might do. When you walk through those doors at this church or your church, wherever you're worshiping it on Sunday, try a new approach to come in there. Come in praising God from the very start. And I'll tell you something, if you will enter the gates with thanksgiving and praise, there will be a time for you to unload all the other burdens. I promise you, He'll be there to meet those other needs. That's what He's able to do, okay? I want us to close out in prayer. I want us to try to apply what we've been learning here tonight. Just um, personal worship. In just a moment, Jonathan may just lead us in a song. But just all over this place, just take a moment and just close your eyes. And make it personal. Who is God to me? Who is God to me? Could I encourage you just right now just begin to thank him for who he is to you begin to thank him for what he's done for you this is your time you're not here for mom or dad or the spouse it's you and God I don't know what kind of trouble you came in here tonight with maybe it was trouble at work many of us have that Maybe it gets a little bit more serious. There's a crisis in our home. Maybe we've got family and friends dealing with a terminal sickness. Maybe we have some grieving death. You know your trouble, but you also know your God. Can you make it personal? Can you make it personal? Take it another step and make it plentiful. Thank Him for it all. God, thank you for doing this. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for working on that. Thank you for helping me here. Thank you for helping me there. Here's the next part. It's going to be challenging. Are you willing to make it public without saying a thing to anybody else? Are you ready to lift your hands? Maybe stand on your feet. Maybe even lift your voices as Jonathan begins to lead us in this song. Eyes closed and just, I want to worship you, God. Do it from your seat if you need to. But just begin to talk to them. Don't worry about who's beside you. Don't worry about what they're saying. It's you and it's God. It's you and it's God. We worship you, Lord. We praise you, Heavenly Father. You're so worthy of praise. So worthy of honor. You deserve, you deserve the praise. We bless you, Lord. All the saints and angels Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Bow before your throne. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. And all Thank you, Lord God. the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb. Thank you, Lord. Of God.
I just want to pray over you now and if you're able I'm asking you to, to stand in this if, if if you need to be seated I understand for health reasons that's okay but if you can stand during this time I'd appreciate it and I just want to pray over you gracious God you have taught us tonight in the midst of our trouble whatever it may look like that we can still worship you we can still approach you and we've learned how we need to do that dear God in a personal way in a plentiful way in a public way but Lord one thing remains and that's us holding on to your promises so I pray tonight for this group of people Spirit of God would you speak to every individual in their unique situation tonight would you give them the promise they need to hear from you tonight. Lord, it, it could be for a spouse. It could be for a child. It could be for something in their own life. But Lord, they need to hear from you, not from me. They need to hear from you. Would you make it so real it would quicken their spirit even now? And they will be amazed at the word of God that comes to their mind and in their spirit at this moment. But they can write it down. And we'll give you praise. We'll give you honor and glory. For it's in the name of your son, Jesus, we ask all these things. Amen. Amen. Can we do that chorus as we close, John? Thank you, brother. Hallelujah. Sing. God bless you all. May keep you. Thank you for being with us tonight.